Hello ladies. In our exciting study of Hebrews, we've learned that Jesus came to earth to live like us. He died, and he's in heaven serving as our high priest. But there's one element of this account that draws a question. Did Jesus have to die? When I was young, I wondered, couldn't God have just taken him up to heaven like he did Enoch and Elijah? Did Jesus have to die? And Jesus asked that question in Gethsemane. Well, Hebrews chapter 9 clearly answers this question. The Jews had waited centuries for the Messiah to come, and Jesus came. They thought he was going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus came, but his kingdom was not of this world. He established a spiritual kingdom. They rejected him, and they killed him. And these first century Jewish readers were part of this spiritual kingdom, the church. But the threat of persecution had discouraged them. And Linsky wrote, a dead Messiah was beginning to look like no Messiah to them. Let's open our Bibles to chapter 9 of Hebrews. We began last week. And here's an outline. We've covered verses 1 through 10 in our last lesson, comparing old covenant elements. First, in verses 1 through 5, we looked at tabernacle furniture. And then we compared the tabernacle rituals, specifically sacrifice, in verses 6 through 10. So today we begin verses 11 through 15. Both the Old and the New Covenants involved blood, which meant the death of a living creature. This helps begin to answer the question, did Jesus have to die? In verses 16 and 17, we'll look at Jesus as mediator of a new covenant. And then verses 18 to 22, inauguration with blood. Verses 23 to 26, Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice. And verses 27 and 28, one death, then the judgment. So part two that we'll look at now covers verses 11 through 15. We're going to examine these verses uh, a few at a time, and then we'll read the whole as a unit. First, let's begin with verses 11 and 12. And I would like for us to note something that stated in the study guide about these two beautiful verses. It says in the Greek manuscript, verses 11 and 12 form one long sentence exalting Christ as our high priest and better once for all sacrifice. So let's slowly read this one long sentence in verses 11 and 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained re eternal redemption. And this begins really a summary of the whole book of Hebrews. But let's read what the, the uh, study guide comments on this. The good things to come, mentioned in verse 11 there, includes all the spiritual blessings available in the Lord's church. The church is the greater and more perfect tabernacle, for which the old was but a type and shadow. The Jewish system of worship, the first tabernacle, was replaced so that all people could become Christians, and we are called priests, the priesthood of all believers. That's an important concept. And we can all come boldly into God's presence. Human high priests entered an earthly sanctuary, that two-room uh, space in the tabernacle, after offering the blood of calves for themselves and the blood of goats for the people. And this ritual had to be done annually. But Christ shed his own blood once for all, and then entered the true or original sanctuary, the most holy place called heaven. I like that. It just really explains verses 11 and 12 there. So now we'll go to 13 and 14, which talks about how much better Christ's sacrifice is than, than the, uh, the sacrifices that the Jewish priests gave. Verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer... Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, looking at verse 13. Blood was required in both the Old and the New Covenants. Now, we looked at Leviticus 16, where the high priest entered the tabernacle and went into the most holy place three times to sprinkle blood. But Numbers 19, we didn't read that. It talks about the ashes of a heifer. This was used to purify uh, 
fleshly entities. The uh, impurities when a person touched a grave or a dead body or an unclean person. So these were the things that the Jewish priest had to do to sanctify or fleshly purify. But verse 14 says how much more, how much better is the blood of Christ. Those blood and ashes purified fleshly entities, but Christ's blood purifies spiritually. And the study guide on page 97 adds, his sacrifice was better because it removed sin. The blood of bulls and goats was a type and shadow of the purifying blood of Christ. We all know that song, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So these verses also mention the eternal spirit. Now Jesus' sacrifice was voluntary. The spirit here is not the Holy Spirit. It's talking about Jesus' own inward spirit because it was a voluntary sacrifice. John 10, 17, and 18 says no man was able to take his life. It was voluntary. And it says there without spot. Leviticus 1, 3 gave the old covenant instructions that the only acceptable sacrifice was the blood of a perfect, unblemished victim. Let's read 1, 3. Leviticus 1, 3. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. So Jesus, we learned earlier, was without spot, without sin, and he gave of his own free will. Then we see in these verses, it cleanses your conscience from dead works, and we learn that dead works means sin. Cleanses our conscience from sin. The study guide on page 97. These rituals in the Old Covenant cleansed the physical body but did nothing for the guilty conscience. Consider which is worse, to be physically defiled or spiritually unclean. Readers were asked to bear in mind that if the ritual sprinkling of blood and ashes was enough to satisfy requirements of physical purification, how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse their conscience from sin to serve the living God? Much, much more. He was a better sacrifice. Now before we look at verse 15, I'm going to read verses 11 through 15 together as a unit. And think of this, Martel Pace called chapter 9 verses 11 through 15 the heart of Hebrews. It, it summarizes it all. Hebrews 9, 11 through 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And verse 15 and for this reason, because Jesus gave his blood, sacrificed it so that we could have forgiveness of sins, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. That was how he became the mediator of our new covenant. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Jesus had to die, it says in verse 15, by means of death, redemption and eternal inheritance are available to those who are called. Who are those who are called? Those who obey. We're told in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, to which he called you by our gospel. God calls us through his word, and those who obey his word are the called. The study guide adds on page 98, Sisters, because of our obedience to the gospel, we are among those called, and we will receive his promised eternal inheritance if we persevere. There's that condition. So now we go to part three. Jesus is mediator of the new covenant. We just read that in verse 15. He's the mediator. He brought the new covenant into force, and to do this, Jesus had to die. This is explained vividly in verses 16 and 17. And we've read those before. You'll find these familiar. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 
for a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. And we've talked about the fact that we, most of us try to have a will so that our property can be distributed as we want after our death. So Jesus had to die so that his will and testament could be put into force. Page 98 it sheds some light. So scripture presents two reasons why Jesus had to die. First, for the forgiveness of sins. We saw that in verse 15. And second, because a will becomes in force only after its maker dies. We see that in verse 16. First, only the blood of a perfect sacrificial lamb could have redeemed us from transgression or sin. Sin came at a price. The blood of bulls and goats was not able to pay for it. Jesus' blood could and did. So... God can now be just in justifying every true believer. And second, the old covenant or testament was inadequate and had to be replaced by the new. Only after death can a will and testament become a reality and an inheritance be claimed. Jesus' death allowed his new will and testament to go into effect and paid the price of sin, making available our inheritance of eternal life. We should know that Jesus' blood splashed backwards, so to speak, to justify those who obeyed him in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, even under the patriarchal age. We see in James 2, 21 through 25, that Abraham, who lived in the patriarchal age, and Rahab, who lived in the Mosaical age, were justified. So let's turn to James 2 and read 21 through 25. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect or complete? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So by their works, by their obedience to God, those actions justified them in God's sight and their sins were forgiven when Christ died because his blood splashed backwards, so to speak. We see this clarified a little better on page 99. The new covenant is better, for it took away even the sins of faithful men and women who lived under the old covenant. Sisters, have you ever wondered how those good people were justified? One commentator noted the cross provides salvation for all the obedient believers of all times. Jesus' sacrifice had power and efficacy that animal sacrifices did not. It was retroactive, reaching back to the beginning of time and fulfilling the promise made to Abraham that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed, past, present, and future. Abraham received this promise, as do Christians today. Now Martel Pace summarized in his commentary, divine conditions had to be met in order for God to offer salvation to his people. All of these were fulfilled by Christ's blood. His blood put into effect the new covenant. His blood took away sins, not only the sins of Christians, but also the sins of the faithful ones of the Old Testament who offered the animal sacrifices year after year, anticipating God's perfect sacrifice. By allowing his blood to cleanse the copies of heavenly things, Christ has enabled us to enter into the true presence of God. And to finish up one more sentence here. The New Testament or covenant could not have been established until he, Jesus, as the testator shed his blood in death. And now we'll look at part four. Inauguration with blood. And verses 18 through 22 will further verify that blood was an essential element in all of God's covenants. Part four, inauguration with blood. What does inauguration mean? Well, Merriam-Webster defines it to dedicate ceremoniously or to observe formally the beginning of something. When we think of inauguration, we generally think of an official ceremony when a new president uh, comes into that position or when a ship is launched. Covenants also began with an inauguration, a, 
official ceremony. We will read in Hebrews 9, 18 and 19 that the inauguration of the new covenant involved blood. But we're going to first read Exodus 24, 3 through 8, the account, and we've read that before, where the old covenant was inaugurated with blood. Exodus 24, 3 through 8. So Moses came, he came down from the mountain with God's offer of a covenant, and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Have you read that before? Did you know that the old covenant at its inauguration involved blood? Well, Hebrews 9, 18 and 19 will remind us of this and then tell us that the new covenant was inaugurated with blood. Let's read Hebrews 9, 18 and 19. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of cows and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, other things were involved, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Hebrews 9, 18 through 21 explain what we just read, that the Old Covenant was inaugurated with a ceremony in which blood was involved, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then, likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So verses 18 and 19 remind the people that the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. Verse 20, which we read in Hebrews, repeats verse 8 in Exodus where Moses said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Let's read the study guide on page 100. It's interesting to compare that phrase, this is the blood of the covenant in Hebrews 9, 20 and in Exodus 24, 8 with Jesus' words in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. In the upper room with his disciples, he, Jesus, established an element of the Lord's Supper that represented his blood. It was the fruit of the vine, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Matthew 26, 27, 28. We are, to do, we are to do this on the first day of the week until he comes again. Acts 20 and verse 7. When I, when I was a child, I heard a sermon that prompted me to always look in three directions while partaking of the Lord's Supper. Backward to the day of Jesus or Christ's crucifixion and death, inward with repentance and thankfulness for forgiveness of sins and forward to the day when Christ comes again. So what do you think about when you partake of the Lord's Supper? This is certainly an idea. But we see from these two verses that this blood was shed to inaugurate covenants, an old and a new. Hebrews 9.21 says that this blood was sprinkled on the tabernacle and the vessels of ministry. And this is verified by Josephus, a first century historian. He wrote in Antiquities 3, 8, 6, quote, The tabernacle and vessels were consecrated with fragrant oil and with the blood of bulls and goats. It's always interesting to see biblical principles and concepts verified with history. Now verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. It says almost because sometimes we read that hyssop and scarlet and uh, Numbers 19, 6 and 7 says water and fire. These were used to purify uh, fleshly or bodily impurities. Uh, it might have been bowls, it might have been robes, it might have been uh, the altar, but physical things were purified with these elements. But, this, but without blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Blood is involved in the forgiveness of sins. Let's look at page 100. 
For ceremonies involving forgiveness of sins, blood was always involved. Leviticus 17.11 states, It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Hebrews 9.22 that we just read adds, Without shedding of blood there is no remission. The Old Testament sacrifices served a purpose only because God connected the animal blood with the bloody death of Christ. In order for people to have sins forgiven and to inherit eternal life, Jesus had to die. So our question is answered. Jesus had to die. But he only had to die once. His sacrifice was a once for all time sacrifice. We find this in Hebrews 9, 23 to 26. Now again, the ritual of cleansing in the Old Testament was for fleshly purification, physical purification. But the new covenant inaugurated by Jesus' blood was an even better type of cleansing. Let's read 23 through 26. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, the hyssop and the water and the fire and the blood of animals, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not he, that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And notice that it says there, as in verse 25, as the high priest enters, presently enters. It was still going on when the Hebrews writer wrote this. The uh, temple was still standing and the sacrifices were still going on. But let's see what the study guide comments here on page 101. The last few verses of Hebrews 9 summarize the superiority of Jesus' sacrifice over those in the old Jewish system. The writer pointed out that animal sacrifices, along with water and ashes, secured a temporary, symbolic cleansing of the tent, its elements, and human flesh. But as Robert Milligan asserted in his commentary, it served only to demonstrate the extremely polluting nature of sin and the great necessity of that real spiritual cleansing, which can be effected only through the infinitely precious blood of Christ. Now Hebrews 9.23 that we read says it was necessary for the copies or the elements in the old Jewish religion to be purified. But, and, and this was done according to verse 19 with the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet and wool and hyssop. But the new covenant offered a better sacrifice for a better purpose. It was a better and a more essential cleansing and that was the cleansing from sin. The blood of bulls and goats cleansed copies of heavenly things, but Jesus' blood cleansed the true elements of the spiritual kingdom, the souls of penitent believers. Inward cleansing is necessary to become a child of God, to be a fit habitation for God, and after death, to enter the true sanctuary called heaven. Verse 24 compares the physical sanctuary, that two-room space in the old tabernacle in the old temple. It was a copy and the Jewish priests went there to offer sacrifices but it's compared to the better sanctuary where Jesus entered. The better high priest entered with a better sacrifice. In contrast to the Levitical priest, Christ did not have to go into the earthly sanctuary made with hands in order to perform priestly duties. He entered the sanctuary of heaven with his own blood and in the presence of God he procured our pardon. Sisters, how blessed we are and how grateful we should be. Then in verses 25 and 26, we see a contrast of the timeline, the uh, temporal versus permanent nature of the sacrifice. The old covenant offerings were temporary, but the sacrifice of Jesus is permanent. And we read that in verses 25 and 26. On page 102, earthly priests poured out the inadequate blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of Jesus justifies all who believe and obey. Earthly high priests had to annually perform the sacrificial rites, but Jesus offered himself once and for all. 
his offering ushered in the Christian age. And we live in the Christian age, and those first century Jewish Christians lived in the Christian age. It was established by Christ's blood after he died on the cross. His sacrifice did away with that old covenant, and we saw that. We read that in Colossians 2.14. His death nailed it to the cross. And let's note another interesting comparison. In the old covenant, even the priests had to be sprinkled and purified physically with blood. Look at Leviticus 8.30. Leviticus 8.30. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood, which was on the altar, and sprinkled it on Aaron, the high priest, on his garments, on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. And he sanctified or set apart Aaron, his garments, his sons, and the garments of his sons with him. So I'd like to ask, is there a comparable purification process for us as the priesthood of all believers? Is there something involving blood that purifies us? Yes. Let's read Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So we are forgiven through his blood. But how do we come in contact with that blood? Well, there are two scriptures that help us understand that. John 19, 33, and 34. John 19, 33, and 34 explain that Jesus shed his blood in his death. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So Jesus shed his blood in his death. So how do we come in contact with that blood? How do we figuratively enter into his death? Romans 6, 3 through 5. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So this chapter has answered many questions about the necessity of blood in the inauguration and the cleansing process, both in the Old Covenant and in the New. And it answers for us the question, did Jesus have to die? And the answer is yes. He came to live like us, and just like us, he died. We have to die unless we're still alive when Jesus comes again. But the last two verses of Hebrews chapter 9 explain that we must die and after that the judgment. The Hebrews writer reminds us that we all must die and then we will be judged. Verse 27. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. The study guide comments on page 102. Death is an appointment everyone must keep. Has God set an expiration date for each of us? No, the Greek word for appointed here means reserved or certain. For someone. One is destined. We are destined to die, like I said, unless Jesus comes first. Each of us will taste death unless we are alive when Christ comes again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. But because of his death, we can look forward after our death to a favorable judgment and eternal life in heaven with Jesus. And we have assurance so we can anticipate his second coming. The last verse of Chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Page 102. What will that day be like? It will be a sad day for those whose sins are not forgiven and for wayward children of God who drift, doubt, become dull of hearing, and quit their spiritual Christian journey but it will be glorious for the faithful who persevere to the end. We eagerly anticipate his second coming to receive our eternal rest and reward. Martel Pace in his commentary wrote, when guilt is removed and one understands that he is forgiven, he can eventually lose the fear of facing God through death. What do the innocent have to fear? One can be calm and peaceful in all calamities when he is aware by faith that he has no guilt before God. This gives us assurance that we are saved. We are on the right path. And we have the answer to the question, did Jesus have to die? Yes. 
so that we could be saved, Jesus had to die. So we'll end this lesson with the summary at the end of our study guide's uh, explanation and commentary on chapter 9. And we'll look forward to chapter 10 here. Some on the Christian journey wonder, why did Jesus have to die? The Hebrews writer explained that blood was an essential element in atonement for sin. But animal blood, the sanctuary, and sacrifices under the law of Moses were merely shadows of true Christian redemption. They symbolically pardoned sins but did not free the conscience of guilt. The blood of Jesus did. His death allowed his new will and testament to come into effect. Therefore, those who are faithful and obedient from all times and all nations can inherit God's promise of eternal life. Jesus' death was necessary. What will we learn in Hebrews 10? In verses 1 through 18, the author completed the central part of his letter, which concerned the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Then he began the practical section of this letter by explaining our responsibilities and privileges as New Testament Christians. I'll read to you the three discussion questions. One, explain why the New Covenant is called Jesus' last will and testament. What is our inheritance? Two, what do you think about when taking the Lord's Supper? And three, how does Hebrews 9, 27, and 28 affect your feelings about death and judgment? I pray that this study has answered for you the question, did Jesus have to die, and motivates you to persevere all the way to the end.